My name is Julian Podgórski. I'm going to talk today about Iceland during this lesson called on the tip of the Atlantic Rift. And the slides which you will be seeing now were prepared by Jerzy Grzejewski, another... Uh, I am a PhD student at the Institute of Geophysics in Polish Academy of Sciences, and Jerzy is also working here with us in, in the Institute. Uh, let me start with a short introduction to the Atlantic Rift. As you can see on this tectonic map of the world, there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, those words in the North Atlantic, and up in the top, at the top of the map is Iceland, where the yellow spot is visible. It's sometimes called the land of ice and fire. We will see today why is it so. It's a volcanic island in the North Atlantic, it lies on a curve, on a band of the Atlantic Rift, and this rift separates two tectonic plates, the Eurasian plate and the North American plate. And this place is a zone of ocean bottom expansion, as shown by the two red arrows, more or less, on, on the head of the Great Britain. The yellow spots on the map indicate hot spots. On, on, on Earth, and as you can see, Iceland is, is one of those very hot spots on the planet's surface. This is a more artistic uh, vision of the, of the situation, and you can see that Iceland indeed lies along the way of the great rift that runs through the middle of, of the Atlantic Ocean. Another scheme, this one time, is more centered on Iceland and shows in more detail the situation on the island. Mm, we can see how Iceland is indeed located on the two tectonic plates at the same time. So part of it, the western part lies on the American plate, while the eastern parts lie on the Eurasian plate. But what does it all mean with all those plates? Um, Iceland is a volcanic island formed by volcanoes erupting, and uh, here we can see the, uh, the cross section of the of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. On the right right picture, you can see how the tectonic plates work, so to say, as they uh, move away from each other. And how do we know is that they do this? How do we date them? If you look on the map on the left, you can see those different colored bands are uh, given different ages. So the cl ones closest to the ridge, to the middle of the ridge, are the youngest. They are uh, 3 million years old rocks, while the ones that go farther and farther away are older and older. And how did we, how did we uh, date them? We use the his, the magnetic, geomagnetic dating. In the history of our planet, uh, the magnetic poles, the north and south, were sometimes reversing. They were changing. Uh, they were changing the uh, their positions. Well, well, and what we do is we measure the uh, orientation of magnetic polarity of the magnetic rocks found in the ocean. Because when we have a liquid medium with magnetic grains that are ferromagnetic, they align themselves in a liquid to uh, match the the planet's the planet's magnetic field. So w w if we look at the arrows in uh, the arrows in the middle of the colorful blocks on the left uh, picture, we can see that sometimes they point downwards, so they are aligned like with north at north towards current south. Sometimes they are aligned uh, so that it, they fit the current uh, alignment of the uh, of the magnetic poles, so with north up, so to say, north towards the north. And this way we can, as we know more or less how long ago did these uh, changes of polarity of, of Earth's magnetic field happen, we can more or less date how old these rocks are. And here is a more large-scale map of, of the situation. We can see that the youngest crust, youngest oceanic uh, crust is found around the ridges, 
while the oldest parts of of the o ocean bottom are found close to Africa and uh, and uh, in in America as well. Here's with the general physical map of Iceland. Mm. We can see it and there are large glaciers, the white spots are glaciers, there are some volcanoes as well. But this this little map might be a little bit more useful to us uh, when we talk about Iceland as a volcanic volcanic island. The pinkish uh, uh, band is the Middle Atlantic Ridge, the one I was talking about before on the previous slide. And the red uh, triangles are volcanoes. So you can see that the volcanoes are quite prominent on Iceland and they are all uh, connected with this, with this uh, zone of Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And aside of, uh, of the volcanoes, the consequen consequence of lying on this very hot and active place on the Earth are uh, sources of warm water. These are uh, hot ge geothermal springs and Iceland uses them intensively for heating their houses and for electricity. And here you can see an example. This is the Blue Lagoon, a spa resort in southern Iceland. It is uh, located close to a geothermal power plant and is fed water from from this from this place. You can see it, in the background there's some something that looks like a power plant, like a factory. It takes the hot water from the ground, uses it to to make energy, and releases to to the to the lake, which is used as a famous tourist attraction and and recreation spa. And there are some places on Iceland where you can see the expansion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the two tectonic plates with our own eyes, without digging into into some complex geological methods. And one of them is Thingvellir. It is a uh, a valley in eastern, central eastern Iceland, uh, on which we can see on this on this particular photo. The two arrows show how the two tectonic plates are expanding and how the valley between them is is uh, made wider and wider with with this expansion. Uh, it was shown by, by research more, more in the past and currently as well that the two elements, the two, uh, the two scar escarpments are moving away from each another. And that's exactly the rift valley, the one that we have seen as the pinkish belt on the map. Uh, the, the place is not only significant for uh, for its geological um, prominence, but also it's important for uh, the Icelandic culture, as the, the area, as you can see here, forms something that looks like na natural amphitheater, like a natural theater, and it was used for the whole of its Icelandic history as a meeting place for for parliament. So when Icelanders wanted to discuss things like law, like court, uh, like justice, they were meeting right here in the middle of the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is another image of Thingvellir. Nowadays, it's more of a tourist uh, tourist destination. Very important, as I said, both because of its geology and its history. What is a element of almost daily life on Iceland is volcanoes. And this image here, you might have seen it before, it's Eyjafjallajökull volcano. It was a massive eruption in a few years ago when um, great amounts of ash were released into the atmosphere. The consequence was, as you may remember, that the air traffic in Europe was effectively stopped for, for some time. Uh, but what should be remembered is that Eyjafjallajökull Layoku was not a big eruption. It, it, it put enough dust to stop Europe from flying, and we remember it, but it shouldn't be uh, thought as a big eruption. 
Nevertheless, on Iceland during the eruption, during the few days when the volcano was active, it was almost completely dark. The ash was blocking the sun and it deposited later all around the island in a layer of thick black dust. Uh, but if the eruption was much, much bigger, uh, the effects would be much more catastrophic. An example could be uh, Krakatau in 1883. It was a great eruption in uh, Indonesia. It was so big that the amount that the whole island almost disappeared from from the ocean, and the amount of ash release was so big that uh, the global climate was affected for a few next years. It was called just colder at the end of 19th century. It was a bit colder. That's because one very big volcano erupted very violently. So even though Ayafiat Fayokut did affect our lives. It wasn't really that extreme. And here's another uh, image of the same eruption. This time it looks much more menacing, so to say, with all the black black ash and fire spewed in into the earth. And again, we're back to the map. Now you can see how Think Vettler is indeed located in the mid-Atlantic ridge, and how the r red uh, spots are all the volcanoes that might potentially potentially hurt us. Mm. And in the top of the map you can see the word Kafla, and it's where we're moving now. We're moving from southeast of the southwest of the island to the northeast. And here you can see a model. It's a physical model, so to say like a diorama, of Lake Mivatn that's located close to close to Kafla. It is a very beautiful place. I hope we have another image. No, we don't. Too bad. Uh, it's a very beautiful place, and it's a lake that formed because the mm, the ground is slowly, slowly moving down here in this area, in the north of the of the island. The sedimentation caused by erosion by rivers carrying uh, material to to the valleys is not fast enough to make up for the tectonic tectonic lowering of this area and this in this lowering water can gather and form lakes and this is a a large lake which is located in the middle of the expansion zone as the two plates the american and, and the eurasian plate expand that happens on this large planetary scale we can see that even on the scale of a a single small valley, it has its very visible prominent effect of a lake being formed. And these are fields of lava. These are fr fields of fresh lava that are is currently being produced from the mid-Atlantic mid rift. Mm. And the big Krafla volcano I have mentioned is uh, Located here, it's not uh, erupting so violently as Ayafiat Fayokut in recent years, but nevertheless, every couple of decades, an eruption, sometimes a small eruption, uh, is happening, uh, putting a new layer of lava in in this in this area. Every couple of decades, this happens, and forms this black layer of thick rock. You can see, and what's very interesting here, as it's an area of active volcanism it the ground here is actually very warm because the lava that is located so close to to the surface that it can heat uh, the the ground quite quite effectively so when you walk this area and touch the stones they actually are warm even though we're in northern iceland where it is usually quite cold And this is another feature of this area, a crater lake, which is filled with very hot water. It's sometimes even 80, 80 centigrade, 80 degrees Celsius hot. And uh, it's actually quite dangerous, this lake. It's not only very hot, but its, uh, its shores are built of very loose material, very loose steel and sand. So it's easy just to slip and fall into this lake. And it's certainly not 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 pleasant to land in almost boiling water. And as you can see, the lake is uh, milky, so to say. It's not transparent. The water is is 
light bluish and this is because of all the materials and minerals and particles that are suspended in the water here. And the extreme case are uh, mud volcanoes. The mud volcanoes, not mud like angry, mud like mud, like the sand with water, they're so uh, saturated with the with the sand, with the silt that falls into them, among others, from from the surface, that they look like boiling uh, mud pits. The surface resembles boiling jelly, it's very dense, very thick, uh, and very hot. And sometimes the bubbles that form on the surface are able to pop, to sort of explode, and then the mud, the hot mud, is released all over all over the area. And that's an example of what I just said. You can see that it's not only the the lake itself that's wet and and smoothly muddy, but also the walls are sprayed with mud regularly with regular in fairly regular intervals and form this layer of thick mud. And those mud lakes, those boiling boiling pieces of of geological jelly are also a consequence of the presence of this mid-Atlantic rift of the warming of the Earth caused by, by the hot spots. And if a source, if a source of, of this hotness, so to say, is not filled with water, uh, the, uh, the gases are released. The bubbling in, in the previous picture is not only because of the water being hot and boiling, but also, and maybe even mainly, because of the large amount of gases uh, released from the Earth's bot Earth's interior, from from the warming ground. And if there's no water in a source, uh, the gases re are released on their own, without water, without mud, without such material. And uh, they carry a very large, big uh, amount there of uh, of sulfur dioxide. It is a rather it is a compound that smells unpleasantly, aside of uh, other sulfuric compounds that are released from these sources, and they're also quite stinky. Uh, but what we can see here is that the concentration is so big that crystalline sulfur can form on the rocks. This pyramid, this simple pyramid of stones, was built by humans in the very precise purpose of, of observing this. And the yellow uh, yellow sediment, you can see the yellow layer, is actually pure clean sulfur that's uh, deposited here from the gaseous, gaseous, uh, gaseous products of the mid-Atlantic uh, rift. And sometimes, as people live on Iceland, even close to, to the dangerous volcanic places, sometimes the fresh lava cover is crawling closer and closer to human settlements. And here you can see this black, this fresh black cover of rock that uh, was the product of eruption that happened quite close to a village. And people, w when the eruption was happening, the people who were living there could actually see with their own eyes how a stream of lava was slowly flowing towards their houses, towards them. Luckily, very luckily, it's almost a miracle, the lava didn't go farther than this and didn't destroy any house, but it it was really close and it's a danger that people in in the volcanic, the most active parts of Iceland have to have to live with. But without, uh, if, if the area is not very active and it's not covered by fresh lava every 20 or 30 or 50 years, uh, tundra vegetation comes in and takes over the the, the lava lava fields. Uh, it takes hundreds of years for such thick vegetation cover to uh, to form, and on Iceland the tundra is the dry kind of tundra. It's dominated by lichens, and there are only some mosses in in the deeper parts of of the terrain in some recesses. 
contrary to, for example, Spitzbergen, which has much more mosses and the tundra is a little bit more humid than on Iceland. And uh, with years and years of, of building up of the lichens, they build something of a mattress, so to say. It's a thick, soft layer. It's actually quite pleasant to touch and lie on. Mm. But that's what forms in hundreds of years without being on, in an area that's not uh, not covered with fresh lava in, in hundreds of years. And sometimes during these uh, fresh lava eruptions, uh, it cr uh, holes are formed in the ground. And they form, they sometimes as big, so big that we can uh, walk into them, then they are caves. They are caves. And these caves are interesting because they are formed when the rock is formed. It's not like in the karst valleys, in karst situations, when the rock is first first formed and then uh, the rain and water are carving caves in it. In case of lava fields, the caves are built at the same time as the whole rock formation, which is which is quite uh, interesting and and exciting to walk into one of those caves. In ge the geothermal water, the sources that I have been showing you that were dangerous and muddy and rather unpleasant are also uh, give birth to something much more exciting, so to say, and that's geysers. It's a phenomenon that was first described on Iceland, and the name geyser also comes from the Icelandic language. And the geyser is a pulsating source of very hot water. It means that it spews hot water and a lot of steam on quite regular intervals. So that uh, nowadays there are obviously tourist attractions, and some of them are 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 uh, erupting so regularly. For example, every five or ten minutes for all the, all the year, all the year round that people just come there and wait five minutes and then this stream of water and steam erupts up into the air and while it looks very very nice it has one big uh, drawback it, that is the smell the smell is very unpleasant because there's a lot of sulfur contained in this water as well so when it erupts it just smells with eggs and it's not not very nice if you stand in the middle of this fog cloud now uh, the uh, the geyser uh, works thanks to a reservoir of water that's located underground, and it's uh, being heated by the geothermal heat from from the ground. And the, as the water is getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it comes to mo boiling point. Uh, steam is released in in inside this underground chamber with water, and suddenly the pressure rises uh, rapidly pressure rises very rapidly and the whole content of water is and steam is just thrown up through through a uh, through a channel that links the underground reservoir with the surface and that's what we can see here uh, the eruption of steam and water and when after the eruption lasts long enough to lower the pressure it dies down and the whole cycle can begin anew as the temperature is now a bit lower, there's no steam in the reservoir, but the heating never stops, so the whole cycle begins anew, water gets heated, it goes to boiling point, the pressure rises, things erupt, and so on, and so on. And the Icelandic people, as I have mentioned before, benefit a lot from the geothermal energy, and particularly from geothermal water. Uh, almost all heating in the houses is coming from geothermal uh, geothermal sources and also a lot of electricity. And here you can see an actual like geothermal power plant that dip it, stay deep in, dipping into the into the ground, into the warm water reservoirs, and using the heat to to power the machines that generate electricity or to channel the hot water directly into central heating systems in, in a nearby town. 
Now the latter fields, the ones that are formed even nowadays, even contemporarily, are a rather flat surface. There are no big slopes, they are not inclined. So the uh, lava that's quite runny, quite thin, thin so to say, in on Iceland can form flat forms. Uh, and uh, once a flat flat lake of lava is formed, it cools into a structure which we can see here. It's a structure that is, uh, looks like pillars, like a whole set of mm, of pillars stuck one next to each another. And when erosion happens, for example, with the use of a waterfall, these columns are revealed, and we can wonder at how beautiful those geological uh, structures are. And on Iceland, waterfalls are actually almost as common as volcanoes or glaciers, so even more, sometimes even more common. It's sometimes e much easier to, for an Icelander or for a tourist to, to go and see a, a waterfall than to go see a volcano. Now we have a close-up of the same photograph where you can see those uh, pillars, those sticks of lava rock as uh, revealed to us, as the internal structure of the lava field is revealed to us by a flowing volcano. The waterfalls are a very picturesque and popular features on Iceland. Here we can see Skogafoss in the south of the island. They are again made into tourist attractions nowadays. Sometimes they are Sometimes their uh, geology and everything around is so favorable that you can walk behind the waterfall. You can take a walk around the whole valley and, and see how the waterfall looks from the other side. But aside of those nice small in the south, there are also a lot of huge, powerful, uh, powerful waterfalls on Iceland in the north as well. And these here you can see a, a, Gulfos, a Gulfos waterfall in the north of the island, but located on a river that uh, is flowing from the huge Vatnajökull ice cap. Mm. It's the biggest waterfall of on, on Iceland. Here you can see how big it actually is. Very big. As you can see, the valley is very deep. Um, and this, and on the next, yeah, on this slide, we can see how the it forms two steps. So it's so the river travels on the higher ground, then it moves over the first step, which is slightly lower, and only then, after a short stretch of the middle ground, so to say, it falls into the deep valley you saw on the previous slide. Um, that's the look uh, downstream of of Gulfos and note how the and the this these waterfalls are a great example of riverine erosion of the processes that form river valleys. Here on this in this stage it's uh, mostly about the sideways erosion that makes the valley wider and wider. But in the very nearest vicinity of the waterfall, for example, let's go back once here, the erosion is more Focused is more active in uh, re receding the the steps, in moving the steps farther and farther backwards relative to upstream, so to say. And here's the the picture even even farther away from the waterfall. As you can see, the river is much calmer now, although the the morphology of the ter terrain, the terraces we can see here show that sometimes, sometimes the river gets much more violent and erosive, and we will get to see why in a short while. Because now, for the last part of our lesson, let's talk about the glaciers, the ice in the ice and fire island, and that's the ice caps. The Vatnajökull that I have mentioned before is the largest ice cap, the largest ice body in Europe, and underneath it there are active volcanoes. There are active volcanoes present underneath a glacier, as well as uh, water reservoirs, like lakes, 
and sometimes when the volcanic activity rises, because let's remember we're still on the uh, on the Atlantic Rift, everything is hot and volcanically active. Sometimes this volcanic activity rises, and the water gets heated again, and some of the glacier melts, and a very very big uh, amount of water is released from underneath the glacier. Uh, first, it travels to subglacial channels, but then it's it's uh, it's released from underneath the glacier and uh, forms a massive, massive wave of water that travels downstream through the rivers. This is called Jökulhlaup. It's also a phenomenon that was described in Navan Iceland. And in places when it rushes out, as you can see here now, now on this slide it looks like a small, uh, small stream, rather safe one. But in, in a situation of Jokulhlaup, it would probably, if not fill the whole valley with water, it would be much, much higher and much more uh, turbid and dangerous. And those uh, floods, uh, floods caused by volcanic activity under glaciers, uh, they are dangerous to streets and bridges around the island so that cross the rivers. So on those rivers that flow from underneath the ice caps, you sometimes get Yoku clouds which can get very destructive. And uh, back to the glaciers, uh, sometimes from, sometimes very often, the ice cap has smaller glaciers that flow downwards from it, and here's one of the cases. The glacier you can see at the end of this lake is Reyta Merkur Yukutl, and it's, uh, it's a glacial tongue that currently it is receding, it's moving back back and back away from the coast, but in the past it was not the case, and it's a nice example of how the glaciers uh, work, worked for the last couple of hundreds of years. Uh, if you, uh, there are evidence that in the 15th century, in either earlier, maybe even in the Middle Ages, uh, there were people living in the valleys and having farms with sheep, living in the valleys that are covered with glacier now. But uh, in after the mid, mid, mid Middle Ages, around the 15th, 16th century, the glaciers started to advance. It started moving forward, down from the mountains towards the sea, and destroying those farms and forcing people away from the area. It didn't get, it didn't move as far as the coast. And uh, if you look at this image, if you look at the shores of uh, the ocean shore, you can see that part of it, the shore is gray, part of the shore is grayish, and uh, farther away, closer to the lake, the ground gets more brown or reddish. And this reddish part is uh, quite exactly the distance, how far uh, into, how far away from the mountains did the glacier move. Uh, the, it, and it's this, this maximal uh, range of the glacier was reached at the end of the 19th century, and since 1903, since the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the glacier is moving away and away from the coast. Now, uh, nowadays, it's seven kilometers away from from the ocean. And when, during recession, it has formed a lake, a very nice, very cold lake of glacial water. And this lake, interestingly, is uh, 200 meters deep. It's a very, very deep, 200 meters deep lake, while at the same time the water table of the lake is only located uh, only located 5 meters above sea level, which means that the bottom is in a very, very deep depression below the sea level. Stud the currently, the studies of, in the modern era, studies of the glacier and the lake gave us very important insights into how ribbon lakes are formed. Uh, because uh, it's a very uh, convenient place, it's quite easy to reach this valley. Obviously, it's a tourist attraction nowadays, as a lake with a lot of ice. And it's easy to research it and to look into mechanism how this kind of lake, the ribbon lake, is formed live. We don't need to, to look into old ribbon lakes, we can use this one to to get to know how does those lakes form and uh, also show that even a small glacier, because Preta Mercurio is a small glacier even though it's, a, it's connected to the biggest ice cap in Europe, but it's small on its own, even this glacier is, has, has power 
enough to carve 200 meter deep valley into the ground. The climate on Iceland, especially in the south of Iceland, is quite mild. The temperatures in summer are at most 20 degrees. It's very rarely warmer than 20 degrees and most often colder in summer. But in win the winters are not too extreme as well. In the south of Island, Iceland, in the south of the island, it's not very often, it's not much frost in, in the south of Iceland. So nowadays the glacier is melting and calving. Large blocks of ice are uh, detaching from the ice front and f uh, falling into the lake and floating towards the ocean. And uh, those icebergs, these are icebergs, are not formed only of ice, but they also contain a lot of material, of volcanic material that's carried onto the glacier, onto the top of the glacier, with uh, wind and water. And you can even see it here on those bits of ice that's flowing in the lake. And some of them are, some parts of them are gray or black, and that's the grains of volcanic rock that are removed from from the top of the glacier with the ice. And as the icebergs melt and uh, the sediment, all those grains are falling down to the bottom of the lake, uh, the modern sediment layers formed. And we can analyze them, we can analyze how the sediment, how the layer of sand and rocks was formed in the bottom, and from this research, from this study, uh, recreate the history of, of the lake and activity of, of the glacier. And in case of this Jokuls Arlon Lake, uh, it's a very clean situation. There isn't many different factors contributing to the sedimentation. So there are no big rivers flowing into the lake and uh, other kinds of er, uh, sedimentation are also quite weak. So the only thing that contributes to the sedimentary layer are actually the icebergs from the glacier. And for the very end, I want to show you a mascon, mascon it's a puffin. In English, it's a puffin. It's a very nice bird, a very cute one, and it's a symbol of Iceland. You can meet puffin toys, puffin teddy bears, puffin everything on Iceland nowadays. And they come to, to the island in, in summer, and then a lot of people are going to watch them, as they indeed are very pretty. That's the end of our lesson. I hope you like it. Thank you for your attention.